heightening emotion, uncertainty, and fear. We are the Riley Divorce and Family Law Firm. We help professionals and business owners get out of bad relationships and protect what's rightfully theirs. I built a team of professionals who are experienced, they're compassionate, and they care. And I think our law firm exudes that. My mom and dad divorced when I was three years old. I also divorced when my son was only one. So my personal experience with divorce has really led me down this path and has made me want to see things done differently in family law. Our firm stands on four pillars, the four C's we call them. We're client focused. People are coming to us in the, the most desperate times in their lives. We have to make sure we're focused on what's important to them. Communication, one of the biggest issues clients have with law firms isn't the legal fees, it's the lack of communication. We make sure we over communicate. Creativity, you have to be creative. It's not one size fits all in terms of solutions. So we're creative in terms of how we deal with our client's problem. And perhaps most importantly, we have to have compassion, knowing that this is a very difficult time for them. And it's about understanding what people are going through and it's about caring about them. We pride ourselves as being great storytellers. I've told over 2000 stories for the CBC. Family law, court, it's about storytelling. And we make sure that when we come in, we tell the story that our client's trying to get across because that's what's gonna move the judge. That's what's gonna convince the judge that our client is a reasonable party. Our client is the honest party. One of the things I, I'm most proud about our firm, we support people emotionally while we're handling the legal work aspect. Most law firms don't provide coaching and for us it's a complimentary gift we give to our clients. We have an amazing divorce coach in our firm who will walk our clients through the emotional aspects of their divorce, who will help them with the how-to. How do I tell my kids about this divorce? You know, how do I tell my husband I want a divorce? When you're in it, you can't see the way out. It's like you're just kind of stuck in this darkness and you just need somebody to guide you and help you. And I don't know any other firms that offer complimentary divorce coaching to their clients. Our firm is remote. We've got clerks and lawyers all across Southern Ontario with offices in Toronto, Ottawa, Oakville, and Kawartha Lakes. We do have the ability to meet one-on-one -on -one with clients in our physical offices, but clients do prefer the remote setting in most cases. We always set our clients up to win, and we do that in a way that is gonna help them move forward with their family and their goals. If you're going through a divorce, don't gamble on the outcome. Don't second guess yourself. We're an experienced team of professionals. We can help you navigate this tough time. The Riley Firm is a firm that will be there to have your back. Good evening. Welcome, everyone. Good evening. Thank you all so much for joining us. Hello. See, we have quite a few people here already. We're just uh, waiting for everyone to join. Feel free to pop your name in the chat and let us know where you're joining us from. Thank you so much for coming out and for spending the evening with us or spending a couple hours with us. Hello, Celia. Nice to see you. Um, tonight's going to be a lot of fun. It's going to be an interactive, educational, informative webinar tonight. We're going to be talking all about how to divorce a narcissist and win in court and in life. <laughs> Absolutely. So and we want it interactive, right, Andrea? We want people to be involved. Fire out your, your questions. We're here to try and uh, you know answer some of them. Uh, keep in mind, there has to be a disclaimer here. We're not giving legal advice tonight. Uh, to get legal advice, you got to retain us and, and let us know about the finer details of your own personal situation. But generally speaking, there's some there's some tips, there's some strategies we can we can help you out with in that regard, more of a discussion uh, than a, a legal meeting per se. Absolutely. And we're going to have an opportunity at the very end for some Q&A. So, you know, just please hold your questions till the end and we'll make sure to uh, answer them. Um, yeah. And if you want to, you know, during the webinar, if you feel like, you know, chatting or you want to put something in for the discussion, just pop it in the chat. Actually, in fact, pop it in the chat, pop your name in the chat now and just let us know where you're joining us from and uh, what you hope to get out of tonight. What do you, you know, what is your biggest concern? What's your biggest desire to know in terms of uh, divorcing a narcissist? Because it's a very, it's a very, very loaded topic tonight. So yeah, absolutely. You know. and, and we often say in our firm, divorce is tough. Uh, divorcing a narcissist, uh, even tougher. And, you know, we've got uh, lots of experience dealing with 
people who've uh, exhibited narcissistic tendencies, narcissistic behaviors. Uh, so we're going to share with you uh, some of the tools we use to, to deal with them, whether it's in court and then subsequent to, to court. You know, how do you move on? How do you resuscitate your, your self-confidence, your self-esteem that, that uh, no doubt if you've been involved with a narcissist, they've eroded at it uh, over the years. So things like that will be happy to talk to you about. Andrea will be able to help you uh, a lot as well with her experience. So, you know, it's an exciting, a fun night for us to help you. And we're looking forward to it. Yes, absolutely. And hello, Noel from Mississauga. And hello, Celia from Ottawa. Um, looking to play your cards correctly. Well, that's great, because Paul's going to mostly be talking uh, legal strategy, evidence gathering, things like that. So, um, so you're definitely in the right place. All right, so it's a few minutes past seven. I think we'll get started now. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, let me let me uh, introduce myself first of all. My name is Paul Riley. I'm the CEO of the Riley Divorce and Family Law Firm. We help professionals and business owners get out of bad relationships and protect what is rightfully theirs. Um, you know, family law. We have uh, offices in in uh, Kawartha Lakes. Uh, and, uh, you know, other areas as well. But let me introduce Andrea Klein first before I talk about the firm, because Andrea is integral to the success of the firm. She's the, uh, uh, the COO of the law firm. That's the chief operating officer. She's also a 20-year senior law clerk. So she comes with tremendous experience in dealing with high conflict relationships. And Andrea is also uh, a trained uh, divorce coach. So she brings that part of it as well. One of the unique things about our firm is that we do provide uh, divorce coaching. And we know at our firm that uh, divorce or separation, it's a journey, but it's a two-pronged journey. There's the legal journey and the emotional journey as well. And, and we lean into that. Uh, you know, we, while we take care of the legal journey of it, we provide support on the, the, the emotional journey that you're going through by providing you with a complimentary divorce coach. And anybody who's used our firm and has met our coach, Michalina will attest, she's fabulous. So uh, Andrea brings all that experience, not just running a firm as she does now, but the, the, the aspect of having coached people, um, you know, she's been tremendous uh, with that uh, as well. So Andrea, you'll hear a lot from her uh, later on. Uh, let me just tell you a little bit about the firm. We do take a holistic approach uh, to your divorce. We educate you along the way, uh, teach you how the divorce process works so you understand why you're employing the strategies uh, that we encourage you to do. Our firm gets you involved in the process. We do the heavy lifting, but you've got to work with us along the way. You're an active participant in the divorce so you can feel secure knowing you have a team of professionals on your side uh, who will always provide you with sound legal advice. In essence, we have your back. And that's something we say to our clients. And that's something we mean. We serve professionals and business owners across Southern Ontario. Um, that is to say, we have offices in Ottawa. Uh, we're in Kawartha Lakes. Uh, we're in Toronto. And we've opened in Oakville, though we've always had clients from Oakville. We now have a physical presence there as we've opened an office there several months ago. Uh, and we're in Oakville. We'll, we'll shortly be expanding to Hamilton, Gatineau, Quebec as well in the new year. So those are the places we're at. That's where we work with our clients uh, most of all. And Andrea uh, can tell you a little bit more in terms of where we're uh, dealing with now in terms of how to win against a narcissist, Andrea. Yeah. So tonight's topic, super exciting, how to win against narcissists in court and in life. So there is so much more, as I was just saying, you know, when you're dealing with a narcissist, there is so much more to it than winning just in court. There is, you know, there's settlement, there's property division, there's equalization, there's support. Yes, there are all those things. And those things are very, very important. But to win means so much more than that. We're going to get into that in a moment. But I want to start off with a quote that we often say to our um, many of our new clients and just some things that I've noticed throughout my career. Um, something I've noticed is the way they behave during marriage is the same way they're going to behave during divorce. So first of all, just from the outset, it's so important to know that 
and to really take that to heart. So what does that mean? If he was, or she was controlling, manipulative, mean, acted like a bully, took advantage of you, exploited you um, during the marriage, then that is most likely the way they are going to behave during divorce. It's just going to look a little bit different. What does that look like during divorce? That looks like not providing financial disclosure when being asked, hiding assets, hiding income. Those are the kinds of things that we see all the time when somebody is divorcing somebody who's a narcissist. So it's really important from the outset just to be aware of that and to be prepared. And that's what we're going to talk about today really is just preparing, preparing to be, to go against somebody like that. Yeah, absolutely. I think one of the uh, things, you know, uh, we, uh, we think it's uh, analogous to, there's a saying in, in sports, uh, you know, if you want to get to the Olympics, you've got to choose your parents carefully. Um, the irony there obviously is, is not lost on any of you, but it's the same with divorce. You want to have a good divorce, you got to choose your partner carefully, as Andrea just uh, said in, in a far more eloquently. Uh, but she's right. If someone who's reasonable uh, during the relationship, if someone was kind, if someone was generous, um, that's what they will be in the divorce. If they were spiteful, vindictive, angry people, selfish people, then expect that. And prepare for that because that's exactly who they're going to be. They're not going to metamorphosize into someone else. They're just going to show more of who they have already shown you during the course of the relationship. Exactly. And and pop it in the comments if this is something you've experienced. You know, pop in the comments. Let us know. You know, what what are you experiencing? Are you finding that, you know, the way they're behaving now during the divorce is just as bad, if not worse, than the way they were during the marriage um, you know, it's, it's tough. I mean, obviously, if they were a nice, kind, generous person, um, maybe you wouldn't be divorcing them, maybe we wouldn't be in the situation we're in. Unfortunately, a lot of the, the clients that we deal with are going through a high conflict divorce, they are divorcing somebody with narcissistic tendencies, or somebody who's proven to be, you know, a really just a not kind, not good person. Yeah. Okay, so first of all, so before we, um, dive into how you know to win let's talk a little bit about what constitutes narcissism what kind of traits and characteristics are kind of a common thread when you're dealing with somebody who exhibits narcissism so the most common thing that we see is that they have a sense of um, a huge sense of entitlement they lack empathy um, they tend to take advantage of others they think that they're superior to others um, and they're often bullies. They bully people, you know, whether it's uh, outright bullying, you know, through the legal system or just, you know, in, in co-parenting, using children as pawns, so to speak, to try to control or manipulate the other party. We see that all the time. Uh, prolific lying. They lie. They lie about everything to make themselves look good. They have an underlying desire to really just exploit others for their own benefit. Um People with narcissist narcissistic tendencies tend to have un an unreasonably high sense of their own importance. They seek validation and attention, and they want people to admire them. And, you know, when you're in a relationship and everything is good and you're in the honeymoon phase and there's love bombing, it's all good. But as soon as you separate or as soon as you start to express things that you don't like or you criticize them, that's when, you know, the, the narcissist can get very angry, very, um, you know, just fly off the handle, go into a rage. And narcissists tend to have difficulty controlling their emotions. So when they're angry, they are very angry and it is very obvious and there is no controlling it. And and do and and, and although Andrew just said how they have this inflated sense of self uh, self-worth, it's all a facade. Uh, it's all a facade because uh, the slightest uh, thing can shatter their, uh, their ego and, and, and sets them off into an angry tirade, as, as Andrea was just describing. Uh, you know, it's an act. It's a charade that they put forward. Uh, these are not people that are super confident at all. The opposite, in fact. Uh, but they carry themselves that way. They portray that. And that the slightest uh, you know, remark or, or what they would consider a diss uh, you know, could set them off. Uh, and, you know, we've seen that uh, repeatedly in, uh, in numerous court files. Yeah, absolutely. 
So narcissists do have an inflated sense of their own self-importance, and they are disproportionately involved in troubled relationships. And again, going back to, you know, if we're with somebody who's kind and generous and supportive, you know, then likely the relationship's going to last. But unfortunately, when you're married to a narcissist, there is that power imbalance. You know, there is that sense of, you know, entitlement. There is that sense of, you know, self-importance. And, and they tend to put themselves above everybody else, above the relationship, even above children. So it's really, really tough trying to be in a relationship with somebody who's, you know, has narcissistic tendencies. So if you've gone out of a relationship like that, I mean, congratulations just in, in that and being able to get out of something like that, because many people stay out of fear, fear of finances, you know, fear of trying to, you know, split up the children, having them in two homes. So, you know, I always say children are always better off in two happy homes than, you know, together in one unhappy home. So, you know, so good for you if you have managed to get out of that. That's amazing. Yes, and, and, that's the not, and, and, that's, and that's not it's not easy because what they try to do and if you've experienced this by all means put it in the chat isolation they try to isolate their partner they try to dis they start disparaging that their friends their family try to cut you off from that support network you 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 had when you met and they try to isolate you so they're in more of a position to control you uh, and we see that happen quite often as well. So Andrea is right. If you're able to recognize what's happening in your world, how you're being treated, and you've decided to get out of it to seek happiness and be free of being oppressed and being beaten down emotionally, uh, you should be celebrated for that because it's not easy. It's not easy to, to get the strength and gather yourself to move on with your life. Yeah, absolutely. I was isolated from very early in the relationship. Yeah, that's uh, that's very, very common behavior. They want to isolate you from friends and family, especially. They don't want you kind of talking to people or, or telling anybody how bad they really are. And they put on a facade, you know, to everybody else. They're this amazing, kind, funny person. And, and you know, they, they make it makes you look crazy. Like, <laughs> like you're the, the crazy one for leaving. But really, they don't know what goes on behind closed doors. So, um, yeah, that's uh, isolation from my family and friends was probably the hardest part. Yes, that's uh, that is tough. And, you know, it doesn't happen right away. You know, it happens. This happens after months and years of being with somebody, too. So so it's tough. I'm stuck with one. Well, we're going to help you with that. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So what does it mean to win? Um, we talked a little bit about this earlier. Winning is so much more than getting a fair settlement, but it is getting a fair settlement too. And what is a settlement? It settlement is just that. It means that both parties walk away a little bit unhappy, but you know, they're not fighting. They're not going through trial. They're not, you know, going the whole process, right? So getting a fair settlement doesn't always mean you're going to get everything you want or everything you're entitled to, but it means you're walking away and you're, you're content with what you have. Okay. So, so first of all, like most cases do settle, I'd say uh, in Ontario, last time I checked the statistics were something like 97% of all cases um, do settle before going to trial. So whether you're divorcing a narcissist or not, I mean, I, I'm sure those 3% that do go to trial are because one of the party is a narcissist, no doubt. <laughs> in all likelihood, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, you know, having said that, still 97% of cases settle. So at some point in the process, you will most likely get a settlement. But uh, it's not always exactly what you hope for. But, you know, at the end of the day, you have to prioritize what's important to you. What means the most to you? Is it keeping your kids in the same school, in the same house? Is it, uh, you know, I don't know. I mean, you have to really think about what to you is the most important for me, it was not walking on eggshells anymore. It was it was a life free of of having to worry about what kind of mood is he going to be in? How is you know how is he going to react to this? How is this going to work? Right? Like, it's it's being free of that. It's just being able to live life on my terms and having my own inner peace. To me, that is the most important thing ever. And that for me is winning. Is just having peace, <laughs> being able to wake up feel great. You know, I'm there for my son and everything is good. I don't have to worry about another person and worrying about his emotions and his anger and this and that. So 
that's what it means to me. And, and what it means to win is going to be different for everybody. But I think overall, you know, it's the freedom to live life on your terms, to rebuild and to start over. And this time you're not starting from scratch. You're starting from experience. You know, this relationship with a narcissist has shown you all of the things that you don't want in a relationship. So going forward, you can make better decisions. You know, you can rebuild. And, you know, of course, yeah, winning also means getting what you're entitled to in accordance with the laws in your jurisdiction. And again, you know, that can vary, right? And settlement, again, is just uh, walking away, but it's walking away with something that you can live with. So that's, to me, what it means to win. Yeah, and settling, and let me just say that, I, I think settling is just that. You're settling. Uh, you're, you're deciding that it's more important uh, to end this 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 thing than than to go on and keep fighting and uh and sometimes you're in the position to do that other times you've got to go you've got to fight and that's what i'm going to talk to you about it's preparing for litigation um you know being prepared for litigation is is always important uh but even more so when you're dealing with someone uh who is narcissistic or has exhibited narcissistic tendencies Part of what our strategies at the Riley firm is to do is to get in front of a decision maker as quickly as possible when you're dealing with a narcissist. If you're dealing with someone else who, who is just a, a normal situation, you can take your time and try to massage things and negotiate. But if you're truly dealing with someone who's narcissistic, you've got to get your client, our client, in front of a decision maker as quickly as possible. Because if we don't, uh, we potentially could be tied up for years just going back and forth as the narcissist plays their game to try to get our client to spend every dime they have because they want to destroy uh, our client. It's an all-out attack. Let's be, let's be very candid about that, okay? When you're dealing with someone with narcissistic tendencies, it's an all-out attack. They will lie. Uh, they will exaggerate. They will try to put people against you. They will make up all kinds of stories to just put their point across, to paint themselves as the one that's that's being beaten down, the one that's being taken advantage of. And the last thing they want to do is to have this thing end quickly because they want to take advantage of you and they want to destroy you financially, emotionally, and psychologically as well. So we know that. And when we identify that we're really dealing with someone who's exhibited those characteristics, part of our strategy is to get this thing in front of a judge as quickly as possible, whether it's a motion or whether it's going to trial. We set that date down as quickly as possible to get you there because we know if we don't do that, three years will go by. Uh, there'll be false promises made. There'll be false, uh, yeah, we'll settle. And then months later, you're back where you started. And our clients be looking around wondering what the hell happened. So when we've identified that we're dealing with someone who's truly like that, we don't waste time. We get in front of a judge as quickly as possible because we know if we do not, this thing could go on and go on for years. Uh, so uh, in terms of keys, in terms of the litigation piece, gathering evidence is the most integral part of this, okay? Okay. We can't go to court based on your intuition, okay? It's not enough. I need you to gather evidence, digital evidence. I would say 99% of all cases now involve some kind of digital evidence, whether it's a, a recording on a phone camera, whether it's a, a social media post, uh, whether it's text messages found, all of those evidence that you find are relevant. We need to gather those and organize them because that is what is going to tell the story. You may be on the righteous side, side of things. You may be the one who's telling the truth and, and the honest party, but you know the narcissist is going to be painting themselves that way and they'll have a story to tell also. They will be st sitting up on the witness stand in their affidavit, they will make you seem like you're the one with mental health issues. They will paint you as the violent one. They will paint you as the dishonest person. The only thing that is going to allow the judge to really know whose story is the most compelling and real is the evidence that you come to court with. So you've got to gather evidence, um, you know, whether it's financial evidence, whether it's digital evidence, gather evidence. 
Um, you know, make sure to document the narcissistic spouse's actions, keep records of all communication, and if needed, ensure you use a third-party app like WhatsApp or AppClose. Those are, uh, those are communication uh, mechanisms that the courts endorse because they know that a record is kept. No one can go in and manipulate. I've had cases where guys have, you know, people have cut off half the text message and only show the part from, you know, from an angry client responding and they've, they've deleted the part that they said to initiate or we've gotten emails that were clearly doctored but with app close or WhatsApp, they can't do that. And that's why the courts really favor those mechanisms. Uh, number two, track finances. Make sure to document the narcissistic spouse's actions. Uh, you know, in terms of the financial piece, uh, you've got to keep track of uh, who spends what, what your banking account is. So many times people come to our, to our law firm and we find out they have no idea even who holds their mortgage. They have no idea what accounts or bank accounts that the family has because they haven't been involved in that. If you get the sense that this relationship is not working out and you're heading down that path, You've got to start gathering as much financial information as you can, tax information, uh, your banking information, accounts. You've got to get a handle on where the accounts are, who has access to them, what banks do you deal with. That's all going to com come into play and play a significant part in terms of your equalization or your net family property statement. We need to know where the money is. Where's the money? Uh, where are the properties? You've got to be able to identify those things. And, and, and it's part of gathering evidence. You've got to track your finances. Um, navigating the legal landscape, you've got to make sure to document their actions. Okay. That is to say, if there's been violence in the relationship. Uh, and remember, violence is defined not just as physical violence anymore. That's That's been changed. Violence is, is now, you know, you can, you, you can, you know, emotionally attack someone, psychological abuse, that's also now considered abuse, financial abuse, if they, they use money and power to, to leverage and control you, that's also now uh, abuse, uh, yelling at you in front of a young child, that's also, uh, you know, considered violence as well. So uh, these are things you've got to keep track of, write down what's happened so you can remember these things. And, and, and articulate them clearly. Uh, you know, this happened in such a date. This happened when, when my kids were present. You've got to lay that evidence out uh, so, that, so that, you know, we know uh, exactly what's happened. So you've got to keep records of all communication. You've got to uh, keep track of what's happened. And, and, and most importantly of all, you've got to hire an experienced lawyer, okay? I've gone up against people in trials and to me, it occurred to me that it must have been the first trial they were doing because they were so disorganized and unprepared, which was great for my client. But you don't want to make that mistake. You've got to hire an experienced firm uh, that knows what they're doing, that has experience in that arena, and that will have your back. Most importantly, hire a firm that wants to solve the problem, okay? Um, there are too many lawyers out there who want to elongate uh, a dispute for no other reason but to to, to get uh, uh, legal fees. And that's a strategy uh, that we just don't believe in. We're convinced that solving someone's problem as expeditiously as, as possible, that's gonna be a happy client. What I've found is even if we win a trial, but the thing took two and a half, three years to get there, that client, even though we win, is, is not gonna be, you know, they're gonna be disenchanted. We wanna solve someone's problems as quickly as possible. Not every law firm does that. So you've gotta hire, an experienced law firm uh, that knows exactly what they're doing. Yeah, and just along those lines too, I just wanna to add to make sure that the law firm you're hiring it just practices family law. You don't want a generalist. You don't want somebody who practices, you know, real estate and family or criminal and real estate and family or somebody who's more generalist. And the reason is because family law is a very niched area. There's you know, a lot of rules, a lot of, you know, professional conduct rules, a lot of, a lot of things that, you know, a lawyer who's practicing needs to be aware of. And just like, you know, if you were to go to a, a surgeon, you know, who specializes in a certain area of the body, you're going to want to make sure that 
that surgeon has experience performing that specific type of surgery. It's the same thing with family law or, or divorce. You know, if you're if you're getting a divorce, go see somebody who spe specializes in family law. Um, we've had cases where somebody's had um, a cohabitation agreement drafted by a real estate lawyer, and it turned out to be disastrous. Disaster. And not have, yeah, and not have any clauses, and it costed the person over a hundred thousand dollars to you know to get out of this to to figure out you know the down the problems with all this contract with contracts so definitely um make sure you hire a specialist make sure you hire somebody who specializes in family law yeah no without question and we're not you know we're in the google era google uh, a family lawyer divorce lawyer someone who does exactly that and only that all we do is divorce people all we do is family law here because we know that you can't be a generalist it doesn't uh it doesn't allow you to become expert in anything if you're just good are, are mediocre at everything. So, uh, you know, um, so gathering evidence, let's talk a little bit more about that. And I'll explain to you exactly the type of evidence that is critical for, for us to win in court. Uh, financial documents, uh, that is the key. That is the fundamental principle of this whole sport of, of family law is, uh, is gathering financial uh, evidence, disclosure, it's called. They've got to give up all the information, every bank account, uh, every investment, properties, all of that needs to be brought forward. You have to disclose. If you don't disclose, you can't get a fair uh, deal done. So disclosure of all financial information is important. Communication uh, records, as I said earlier, text messages, anything threatening, anything demeaning, anything regarding a child, a property, a bank account, you want to gather that evidence in digital form bring that forward, that's critical. Uh, witness testimonies. Now, let me be clear on this. Witness testimony, of the three things I've said so far, witness testimony is probably the least impactful. Why? Because you're gonna bring your friends, they're gonna say you're the greatest mom and the greatest dad and the greatest husband and the greatest wife, uh, and they're gonna bring someone saying exactly the same thing. So the courts often weigh that, you know, family members and friends come in vouching for you. Courts don't put too much on that. They understand you're only gonna bring people who like you and who can support you. So they'll take that evidence, sure. Uh, but it's the, it's, the, it's the financial piece that's on paper, that's in digital form, it's bank statements, it's, it's text messages or emails that clearly show someone's uh, temperament. That's the stuff that, uh, you know, is really compelling because you can't, you know, that that's there. It's tangible. It's it's there. It's not someone's uh, love for your opinion because they're your family member. But uh, so so you've got the financial piece, the communication, witness testimony, um, and documentation of parenting abilities when there are children involved. Let me be clear with this point: when kids are involved, the courts don't care about your feelings. The courts don't care about the other side's feelings. The courts only care about the best interests of the child or children. That's what they care about. So they're going to be looking to see who's been the real nurturing parent here, who's had real time with the kids, who has a good relationship, uh, who's been integral in their development so far. Now, the laws say, right, that it's 50-50, in essence, that the child should be with each parent equal time, if possible. That's the law. Uh, but the law also says that it's, you know, if it's not in the kid's best interest to be 50-50, then they're going to go with what's in the child's best interest. So, so yeah, you've got to have evidence to show documenting, you know, your parenting abilities, uh, how engaged or involved you've been as opposed to the other party. That is uh, critical. Uh, for the court to decide who, you know, perhaps gets more time with the child, more parenting time, if that's going to be the case, uh, who gets decision making uh, regarding the child. And as far as family law, family law, I know one of the things people come in, they're always like, I want full decision making. Well, that only really applies to three areas. It applies to education, what school that the child is going to go to. It applies to health. Uh, for example, in the pandemic, you know, if, if uh, one parent didn't want Vax, if the other wanted Vax, then it would have normally fallen to the parent who has that decision making over health um, and uh, and religion. Religion is a third. Other than that, whoever the kids with at the time gets to decide, um, you know, but it's those three key areas 
uh, that uh, evolve around decision making. And the other type of evidence that's critical at times is expert testimony. Okay. Uh, that is to say, if someone's alleging they can't work anymore because they're hurt, well, it's not going to be your opinion that, 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 you know, sways anything. You're going to have to go out and get an expert to confirm that. Or, or if someone brings a child from another country and says they can't go back with the child or they'll be persecuted, well, then I've got to get an expert in that country to either substantiate that or refute that. Uh, so you get experts involved that way. Or if a child has a certain type of ailment or disease, we may need an expert to say, well, based on these parents, this, you know, the child's better here because mom knows how to deal with this or dad knows how to deal with this. So that's how expert testimony comes into play. And it can be critical, uh, you know, when you bring someone in and it has to be someone obviously arm's length. It can't be your brother who's an expert or your cousin who's an expert. It's got to be a legitimate person that, that isn't going to be swayed. A third party is what uh, the courts normally look for there. While we're on that third party uh, topic there, actually, Celia had a great question. She said, what about teachers and coach testimonials? I think that's, um, you know, that's definitely something that gets taken into account. Um, at times, it depends on obviously where you are yeah. in the process and all of that. But yeah, if you're at a point where let's say, you know, an independent investigation is being conducted by the office of the children's lawyer, the children's lawyer will often reach out to teachers and coaches and doctors and, you know, other kind of collateral references and ask, you know, how, how was mom with the kids? How was dad with the kids? Right. So yeah. oftentimes, yeah, teachers and coaches can get involved if, uh, if so I got to say, teachers are always reluctant. It's always like pulling teeth, getting teachers in there to, <laughs> to testify. I don't know. I don't know what they, uh, what, why, but it, they're the toughest, uh, they just want to stay out of things. Uh, and uh, but but yeah, a absolutely. We've had uh, a myriad of cases where, uh, you know, we've had to go to the schools and just in essence, uh, one parent will be saying, uh, you know, the other parents doing a terrible job that uh, the kid is suffering. Uh, the kid is having nightmares. The kid is is acting crazy at home. Well, we'll check the school and the teachers will say, no, absolutely. No, the child's fine. The child's great. The child's excelling. Okay, so there's a disparity there because the psychologist will say, well, if the kids exhibited this at home, the schools will be seeing it too. So we've used that to refute uh, allegations being made by one parent by checking on the school and say, do you see anything even remotely consistent with what's being alleged over here? And the teachers or parents or guidance counselors will say, no, actually, little uh, Joe is doing great and is, one of, is the top student in the class and is very helpful and caring. And, and then that is way because then a judge will look at that and say, well, I don't believe this is happening here because it would be exhibited here as well. So, yeah, the roles that those experts can play are, are vital uh, in terms of a, a really high conflict situation, either to refute or substantiate uh, allegations being made uh, by by a one party or the other. Um, absolutely. Yeah. And that's right. And in terms of marriage counselors, or we had another question just about what about counselors? Um, there tends to be, you know, more privacy concerns with things like that, you know, like client uh, confidentiality and stuff. So counselors are unlikely to give um, expert testimony, I guess, unless it's a trial or something like that. But um, but that's yeah. that's more rare to see that. Yeah. And it, but if you are bringing a counselor, they got to be make sure they're accredited, uh, make sure they're real. Make sure they didn't get their counseling certificate, uh, you know, at the local bar, um, you know, uh, because we've seen cases where someone's trying to put forward a counselor uh, as, as an expert and they're not, uh, you know, and, and that that doesn't do anything to fortify your position. If you're bringing in someone who literally, uh, you know, did a one week course uh, while on vacation and, uh, you know, in Cuba, and now they come back as a counselor, that's not going to help you much in a serious trial involving serious matters. So uh, make sure they're, they're really serious people if you're gonna put them forward uh, to fortify your position. So tips for collecting uh, evidence, um, you know, be organized. Every family lawyer's favorite client is an organized client. Someone who's come in with their stuff, uh, you know, with their financial stuff, uh, any communication they may have, they know where to find stuff. That's critical uh, to help your lawyer 
uh, be able to articulate your position and to advocate for you. So please be organized. Um, you know, um, anything that happens, uh, you want to record it promptly. You don't want to count on your memory. Oh, yeah, four months ago or three years ago, I remember in 2014, he did this. Uh, you record it. Uh, record what's happened, uh, you know, so that you have the evidence and you, you can recall it. Uh, ensure authenticity. You know, we just won a trial um, a few months ago where the guy just tried to fabricate evidence upon evidence and it became very clear, you know, um, it's not going to work. Um, you know, that stuff may work on, on television or a late night, uh, you know, TV show, but in court, it doesn't work. It's You're going to be exposed, uh, you know, if they try to, to fabricate uh, evidence or, or make it up or, or um, cut and paste stuff. It just, uh, it's, it doesn't work. So ensure that what you're putting forward is authentic and seek professional guidance. I can tell you this. Uh, trying to do family law on your own is a disaster. Um, lawyers who are criminal lawyers or corporate lawyers, they hire us. Uh, they hire family lawyers to, to help them because it is a labyrinth, uh, uh, you know, rife with uh, various hallways. You can find yourself lost down and wrong forms and things get dragged out. It's just not uh, the way to go. Get professional guidance if you want to to truly get a good result um that that i can assure you uh it doesn't work there's a saying in law and it's a saying for a reason uh anyone who represents themselves has a fool for a client it's just too emotional a space you're going to make mistakes and you're going to end up uh needing someone to dig you out of a deeper hole so get professional help andrea Absolutely. And just another thing on that point, uh, getting professional help, you want somebody if you're dealing with a narcissist, you need somebody to communicate on your behalf, because somebody who's narcissistic is going to be very bullying, they're going to be very, you know, uh, just very angry all the time, and they're going to be attacking you. And so you really want that third party, that professional there to kind of act as a buffer between you and your spouse, too. So that's really important. And that's why it's really good to have counsel early on in your divorce so that you're not trying to deal this yourself. The other thing a lot of them try to do is let's just figure this out on our own. Let's just sign this little kitchen table separation agreement here and let's just figure it out on our own because usually it's beneficial for the narcissist not to have to provide evidence, not to have to provide financial disclosure. So um, that's one thing that we see uh, very early on when we consult with people is, you know, that the narcissistic ex has presented them with an agreement and has told them that they should sign it right away. So that is the number one thing not to do when you're going through a divorce. Make sure that you always seek professional guidance and get professional help, especially when it comes to something as serious as, you know, a long term marriage that where you're dividing assets and possibly a home and all kinds of things. So that's great. So we're going to talk a little bit now about the emotional side, because divorce is just as much an emotional process, if not more than it is a legal process. And that's why it's so important that you, you, you know, acknowledge your emotions and really deal with them while you're going through the process, right? Because you want to make sure that you're also healing through this. This is your healing journey too. You don't have to attend every argument you're invited to. I always say that our power is in our response. Um, again, when you're dealing with somebody narcissistic, they are going to be very upfront, very confrontational. They are going to be trying to elicit a reaction from you. So your power lies in your response. You don't have to react to them. You can just simply respond with yes or no, or, you know, just a very simple, sweet and simple answer. You don't have to engage. Your power is in your response. So react less because your peace is your power. <laughs> Yeah, no, without question, I, I couldn't agree more. Uh, and I've seen it repeatedly, uh, you know, where once a lawyer steps in and, and they no longer have act in a couple of cases, you know, the, they weren't allowed to talk to our clients. Um, there was, uh, you know, a restraining order or part of their, uh, their uh, recognizance. Uh, there was assault allegations and things of that nature. And they did anything they could just to to uh, to get our client to emote by, you know, having their lawyer send me, you know, just ridiculous correspondence that they know I was obligated to share with my client, obviously. 
Uh, but, you know, I would always, as Andrea just said, counsel my client and not emoting, not giving power to this person who we're getting out of your life. But if the person can control you by just sending a message and cause you to to uh, get that uh, emotional, um, you know, then they're winning and they're they're enjoying that. So uh, but it's a process. And I know when as Michalina, our coach would 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 uh, attest it, uh, you know, it takes time to get past that but uh, yeah absolutely um you know you, you you don't want to attend every argument you're invited to you're absolutely right Andrea yeah yeah it's important that's why it's important to have a coach or a therapist or somebody that you can talk to somebody that you can vent to and get all of that out because they are going to instigate you they are going to try to attack you in their communication they are going to try to elicit a response so don't um don't give in don't give your power away as Paul just said that was a great way of putting it um, I'd love to know, you know, put in the comments right now, pop in the chat. What is, if you could say one thing to your ex-partner right now, what would you say? I'm just going to give everyone a minute to just uh, pop in the chat because this is, this is an opportunity to vent, <laughs> to say, what would, what would you say to your ex if you could, you know, if you could really have a real and raw conversation right now, what, what, what is it that you would say? Give everyone a moment to put it in the chat. You're acting like a child. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> yes, most often they do. No, well, the time is up. Enough is enough. Yes. Yes, love it. Yes, a lot of them do act like children. Um, they do, right? And I mean, narcissism, the root of narciss narcissism comes from childhood. It comes from, you know, childhood experiences, unhealed child trauma that's happened in childhood. So, you know, yeah, that's that's why there is a lot of that. That's no excuse for their behavior, but it often does explain why they're acting like that. It's unresolved trauma. Love it. So let's talk a little bit about... Is this right? You are burning up our kids' future inheritance. Yes, yes, that's a good and, one. And let here. me and, and let me just uh, just before you continue, Andrew, that's mm -hmm. absolutely right. You know, I actually had a guy um, uh, once say to me, "Paul, I'd rather spend a million dollars with you than give her a dime." So you're right. Uh, when there's such anger involved, uh, they'd rather burn the whole house down, quite frankly, than than give you or give someone half of it. So we deal with that all the time. Um, we're not always on the, on the righteous side where, you know, but uh, we've seen it on, on both sides. Yeah. Yeah. While you were cheating all along, you were accusing me of cheating. Yeah. And that's often what they do, right? They, they project. So, you know, if, if they're doing something, they're going to say you're doing it. Right. That's, yeah. that's very, very common yeah. um, for narcissists. Yeah. Yeah, it's sad, but that's true. I mean, this is, and it's good. You know, it's healthy to get these things out, to actually get it out in the open, write it down, journal, you know, um, talk to a friend, talk to a family member, speak to a therapist, a coach, get it out because it's really, really healthy to get these things out. Um, you shouldn't be holding it in. Um, but, you know, obviously like the lawyers and the legal system, that's not really the way to do it, but it is definitely healthy to get it out. Does not own his truth. No, very rarely do they, Karen. <laughs> very rarely do they own the truth. Okay, so let's talk about preparing yourself emotionally, because we talked about preparing yourself legally, evidence collecting, documentation, and all of that, which is all really important. But let's now talk about preparing yourself for the process, because you really do need to prepare yourself. This really is a process. And it can be a long and drawn out process, as some of you are finding out already, you know, this stuff takes a long time from start to finish and you need to take care of you because there's a lot of um, there's a lot to deal with here. So the first thing you want to make sure you're doing is you want to minimize any unnecessary communication. So what is unnecessary communication? Anything that does not have to do with co-parenting your kids, anything that doesn't have to do with the divorce or settlement, you want to minimize. So, you know, the bad mouthing, the, the accusatory back and forth emails, the text messages, you know, 
address the part that has to do with the child, the settlement, whatever it is, anything that's accusatory or blameworthy or anything like that, just ignore it. Don't respond to that stuff. Don't engage, right? Because again, you give your power away when you engage with that type of behavior, that type of communication. So you want to make sure you're only responding to what you need to respond to. You're only communicating when you need to communicate something. Is it about pick up or drop off times? Is it about a location where you're going to, you know, go pick up the child? Is it about, you know, flexibility and changing a weekend around or something like that? Those are the things that you want to communicate about. But if there's anything that you can, if you don't have to communicate, don't communicate. <laughs> and as Paul said earlier, to keep communication through a third party app, like, WhatsApp, our family wizard app close. There are so many apps that can help kind of control the type and the tone of communication. And oftentimes court will use those. You can use those in court as well as evidence if it need be. You want to make sure also that you're gathering a strong support network around you. You want to have, you know, family and friends that fully support you. Again, that you can vent to if you're dealing with somebody who's not really helpful in terms of picking up the kids or helping out with activities and you're now a single parent, make sure that you're creating that a support network around you so that you have somebody that you can reach out to, somebody that you can ask for help. Hey, you know, can you pick up Johnny from hockey tomorrow night? I have to work late. Or can you help, um, you know, with meal prep or something like that? You know, there, maybe you just need a Netflix and chill wine night with a girlfriend, you know, make sure that you make time for those things. Your support network is so important. I can't stress that enough. And this is critical. Uh, and this is critical because I've seen it, uh, whether it's a uh, uh, narcissistic uh, male, female, I've seen it on both sides where they, they, as we talked about earlier, they try to isolate you. Uh, mm -hmm. So, so part of what they do is try to isolate you from other people who care and love you and support you. So, so when you know that this thing is ending, you've got to get back with those people. You've got to get your tribe back, people you can count on, people you can go to who are going to be supportive. I'm not talking about people who are just going to feed you emotionally and make you more angry. That's, that's not helping you. Uh, you need people who are going to be able to listen to you and support you and love you. Um, you know, resuscitate your, your self-confidence, your self-esteem. You need that help, especially if you've been in a long-term relationship with somebody who has just dissipated that, right? You hardly recognize yourself sometimes when you come out of these relationships. So, so Andrea is absolutely right. You got to go get back with your tribe. You've got to get back with family and friends who actually care about you. You've probably been shunned over the course of the relationship as they've isolated you, the narcissist has, uh, to, to, to just rely on them uh, because that's how they control you. So, so when you see this thing is ending, man, you've got to reach out and find the people who love you. They'll still love you, but you've got to go back and, and pull them back in because you are going to need them as you go through this battle with the narcissist. Absolutely. And even just with what we do, with what Paul and I do, oftentimes people will have a friend or a family member on a, a call with one of our lawyers or our, you know, our clerks, if they're doing a financial statement, just to kind of, you know, help them along, help them understand this is a very stressful emotional process. Sometimes it's hard to absorb, you know, with all the legal jargon back and forth and all of the different forms that need to be filled out and all the different disclosure types that you need to provide. So having somebody there, um, just to kind of help you just to help you and go like, Hey, did you, you know, I, did you miss that? Cause I got that. Or, you know, do you remember what they asked for? It's really helpful to have somebody on these calls um, with you. And we see that all the time and we encourage that. Yeah. Netflix and wine can later be get portrayed negatively by the narcissist. How can we counter that? Okay. Well, maybe Netflix and water, <laughs> sparkling water. <laughs> it doesn't have to be wine, <laughs> but uh, you know, it's just to have, have friends there, right? That's the important thing. You want to make sure that you're prioritizing your self-care. This is a time more than ever that you really need to take care of yourself. I've seen so many people get sick through the process of divorce um, just because of all the stress that they're under, you know, trying to be a single parent, trying to, you know, separate assets, going through the legal process. It is a super stressful process. So this is a time that you really need to treat yourself with kindness and compassion this is where you need to start trying different activities, start finding some hobbies that you enjoy, 
for me, when I was going through my divorce, journaling was really helpful. I just found just writing it all out, getting it out of my head, getting it onto paper was amazing. Um, but there's therapy, there's coaching, again, trusted friends and family, venting, um, and just just being around people that you know bring you joy, being around people that make you feel good. Um, and try activities like yoga, meditation, exercise. For me, exercise is very healing too. Just getting outside, getting natural sunlight, walking every day, be consistent with it. Um, yeah, you need to prioritize. This is a time when you really, really need to prioritize self-care. And, and unfortunately, it's a time when most people don't prioritize self-care because this is a very stressful time. And, you know, we're thinking, oh, my God, I've got kids, I've got activities, I've got a job, I don't have time to take care of myself. And this is when it's most important that you take care of yourself. So make sure that you're doing something that's just for you, even if it's just a small thing, start small, start with five minutes a day, start with journaling a sentence or two, you know, start small, but start somewhere because this is the time you really, really need to focus on your self care and really minimize the stress as much as possible. Yeah. Without question, you know, you're in these relationships with people and you think they, they care about you. You think they are going to look out for you or look after you. Uh, but it's not always the case, you know, and, uh, and when this thing ends, uh, you want to be able to to walk away from this thing fully intact, okay? That's emotionally, psychologically, physically as well. And I get it when you're in this 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 terrible relationship where you're beaten down every day, if not physically, certainly emotionally, psychologically, financially. It's hard to lift yourself up. But you know what I can tell you: the one thing, all the stories are different. Every file we get is different, right? They're nuanced. Some of them are similar, but there are always a lot of differences. Uh, here's one thing I can consistently tell you that our clients always say. Uh, this one familiar lament. They all say it. I wish I'd have done it sooner. They wish they'd have gotten out of this type of relationship sooner, you know? So when you're getting out of it, look after yourself. Get physical again. Go for walks, as Andrea has said, whether it's yoga, whether it's meditation, whether it's uh, you know, aqua fit. I don't care what it is, uh, but you've got to start looking after yourself because that person uh, did not. And quite frankly, your well-being is the least of their concerns right now. So you've got to offset that and just start taking care of yourself again by being around good people and, and, and yeah, self-care vital at this time. Absolutely. I'm a big believer in the law of attraction too, right? You show yourself that love, that kindness, that compassion. You are eventually, that's what you're putting out into the, the world. That's what you're going to attract. So it all starts within, right? It all starts with taking care of yourself and small steps, baby steps, because I know it's really hard right now to turn your life around and go, okay, that's it. I'm going to eat healthy every day and I'm going to cut out carbs and I'm going to cut out chocolate and I'm not going to drink wine anymore. No, I mean, it's impossible to do all of that at once, but start somewhere, start small, start with five minutes of journaling, start with a, you know, one yoga class a week, see how you like it, you know, just try different things. This is your opportunity to rebuild your life on your terms. So start to figure out where you want things, what works for you. I love that. I literally, I journal literally every single day. That's awesome, Natasha. Good for you. That was, uh, that was my saving grace. Still is. I still journal all the time and it's, it's fantastic. It really helps. You want to make sure that you establish boundaries. You teach people how to treat you and you do that through your boundaries. So, you know, whatever, you're allowing them to get away with, you know, how people are communicating with you. Are they treating you kind of like a last minute option or are they treating you really well? You want to make sure that you're really setting boundaries, only allowing people into your life who are going to be kind to you, compassionate and, you know, share your values. Um, and you need to obviously establish boundaries as well with your ex. So again, in terms of communication, how are you responding? What kind of communication are you allowing? right? That's really, really important as you move forward is establishing those boundaries. And you need to safeguard your mental health. And this, that, I mean, that's really what it all comes down to. You need to take care of you. Um, wh whether that's scheduling maybe a meeting with a divorce coach or a therapist, depending on, on where you are in the process and how you're feeling, um, you've got to take care of yourself. You've got to create a plan for yourself. You've got to really think about what matters most to me right now. 
start to create a plan, outline what your goals are. What are your goals? Because now they're not, you know, shared goals anymore. These are your goals. What are they? And how can I make them happen? So now we're going to talk a little bit about co-parenting with a narcissist, which if any of you are currently dealing with this, I am so sorry, because I know it is not easy trying to co-parent with a narcissist. Tell me in the chat if anyone's actually dealing with this right now and what kind of challenges you're having um, co-parenting with a narcissist. Yeah, this is uh, this is such a... Uh... It's so hard, you know, when, when the kids are involved in these things, um, you know, when we do files and it's just adults, you know, whether it's, uh, you know, it's been a long-term marriage, so the kids are now adults or, or if they don't have any children yet, it's so much easier to deal with because, um, you know, when kids are involved, man, that's a whole different level of emotional entanglement. And even when we, uh, extricate you from the narcissistic relationship yeah you still got kids with this person right and they've still got you know parenting time and uh figuring out how to navigate that and figuring out how to uh you know keep communications to you know very little and always about the child you know sometimes our, our client may, may be able to manage that but if it's a real narcissist on the other side you know there's only so much the courts can do, right? The courts will say in the order, do not disparage the other parent. And within a week, our client will call us and say, he's disparaging me as, as the other parent. So the courts can give these orders. The courts can't turn someone who's an ass into a nice person. They can't. So, yeah. so then it becomes, well, what's worth going back to court for? Uh, as they continue telling kids about the legal process or telling kids that, you know, the other parent is, is, is terrible or they should, they're not taking care of you. It's hard. Uh, you know, so co-parenting with a, uh, co-parenting with a narcissist is, 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 is very challenging, Andrew. Very, very challenging. Absolutely. I see some of the comments already, you know, says one thing and does another. Yeah. Constant lies, poking, um, that, I, that I'm not thinking about the kids. They don't co-parent, they counter-parent. Um, yeah. My ex-wife has alienated my daughter from me. My son sees the abuse I went through. It's, it's awful. And that's exactly it. You know, you see alienation all the time when you're dealing with a narcissistic parent on one side, or sometimes both sides, actually. Um, on app, communicates in a nice tone and then sends a lawyer letter with a rude tone. Yep, <laughs> we see that a lot as well. Um, counter parenting. I like that, Karen. That's that's exactly what I would call a counter parenting. Um, yeah, that's that's exactly it. They don't parent. They act like friends. Yeah, yeah. Those are those are the. Uh, that's what we see all the time, right? And and I always say, you know, divorce doesn't hurt children. Conflict hurts children. And when you're in a, a high conflict relationship or high conflict divorce. You know, children are often put in the middle and they're used as pawns and, uh, you know, they're not even really seen as people. They're seen as leverage a lot of the time, you know, and, and it's really, really sad. It's really tough to watch that. As Paul said, you know, we can't, no court can force somebody to be a good parent. Um, all we can do is control our part of in the co-parenting dynamic, control what we do, how we make our children feel and take steps to protect our children, right? In the best way possible. So, you know, it's really hard. Oh, sorry, go ahead, Paul. Yeah, it's so hard, you know, because I, you know, we've had cases, uh, we had a case where, you know, we represented a, a doctor in, in Toronto and, you know, his ex, I mean, made up these vicious lies uh, about him because she wanted to move out of, uh, out of the country. And she knew she wouldn't be able to do that if he was still in the boy's life. So she made up these, these vicious false allegations. Uh, you know, he went to two criminal trials, uh, found not guilty both times, and both times they questioned, they raised issues with her credibility. One thing I could say, every family court uh, adjudication we went to, the judges in family court didn't believe anything uh, she was saying, but you know who did believe her? The police and CAS. 
So we had to get a special order at the end of the, the final trial to keep CAS away from my client because uh, she just kept making up stories, just fabricating. She clearly didn't have her son's uh, you know, best interest in mind. She thought just moving dad out of his life forever would somehow be good for him. And this dad is a great dad. And, uh, you know, but we won every step of the way. Now it took years because once again, she kept making up allegations and, and, and convincing authorities. And then we'd have to go through the process. So I've seen some vicious attempts uh, where they only care about themselves and not the child. The opposite, in fact, uh, they just, they, they, they tell kids adult things. They tell kid, the kids the, the, the court file. They, they literally raise every issue that they've been told not to say to kids and they tell the kids and they try to alienate the other parent and they try to lie and uh it's it's tough so so you know parenting co-parenting with a narcissist is a it's a tough task one of the things i i seek solace with my clients in is reminding them the kids are going to grow up and at some point the kids always kind of figure it out who their rock is and who the unstable person is, and kids are pretty savvy. So if you could just, you know, maintain your composure, still be the solid parent, uh, you know, still be that child's rock. Eventually, kids do do figure it out as as they get a little older. Yeah, absolutely. And co-parenting is almost impossible when you're dealing with a narcissist. What you want to try to do more or less is what's called parallel parenting, right? Because co-parenting is where you and your spouse work together. You talk, you create plans for your kids, you're, you're flexible, you, you know, you have, you know, your spouse knows what's going on and you know what's going on at all times while it doesn't matter who the child is with. Parallel parenting is very different. Um, and in cases where you're dealing with a very high conflict narcissistic person, that is usually the way that parents have to parent because you can't co-parent with a narcissist, to be quite honest. So parallel parenting means that when the kids are with you, you're making decisions. The day-to-day -day is all, you know, is all under your control. And when the child is with the other parent, they make the day-to-day -day decisions, but there's very little communication with parallel parenting. So it's much different, but that tends to be the way that most people have to parent with a narcissist. So, you know, that's, that's what generally tends to happen. Um, you know, obviously, there needs to be a lot of flexibility, especially if you're dealing with young children, you know, there has to be a lot of flexibility. Generally, the narcissistic parent is not flexible. They tend to be inflexible. They tend to be very difficult. And again, that's why it's really, really important to make sure that you've got great representation, because and, that tends to be a problem. Go and ahead. let me say this, the courts that rep, the courts recognize how difficult it is to, uh, to, you know, to co-parent or parallel parent. Uh, and, and the courts, uh, just because the divorce ends, the courts don't wash their hands of it. Uh, you know, uh, alienating of parents used to be dealt with a different way. Uh, now the way it's dealt with is very serious and some would say drastic. Uh, for example, if a parent uh, keeps the child from uh, the other parent uh, four weeks, five weeks, six weeks, whatever it is, uh, and, and, and we have to bring a motion and we claim there's alienation and they've kept this child away for five or six weeks or whatever. If you win that motion, the courts now are saying, okay, how many weeks was it that uh, he didn't? And they will literally take that child and give them to the other parent for the duration, uh, exactly the amount of time that they were withheld without seeing the other parent. And if it goes beyond that, they could literally say, okay, you are now the primary parent other parent you're only getting every other weekend or only on Mother's Day or Father's Day or whatever, depending on the facts of the case. So the courts are trying to deal with this because they recognize that once the divorce happens, that's not the end of it. And kids are still being harmed by, uh, you know, a narcissistic parent who wants to hurt the other parent by withholding a child or alienating a child, telling a child they can't go there because they're not safe or they're not well or whatever. Um, if we bring that action to court and we win, now what the family courts are doing, and it's pretty new, they're now saying, okay, you missed four weeks, here you go. You've got the child for four weeks. You can't even get a FaceTime call for the next four weeks because the other parent didn't. And the courts will tell them if this continues, 
the steps may be in fact that this parent here becomes the primary parent and you are relegated to, to you know, once a month visits if, uh, if they deem it that, uh, that necessary. So the courts are trying to deal with it. The courts recognize that, you know, once the divorce ends doesn't mean that everybody's going to uh, play fair. And when kids are involved, uh, this is now one of the ways the court tries to deal with alienating parents by making it, you know, literally taking a child and giving them to the other child. And a blackout period ensues where that parent sometimes can't see the kid for weeks or months, in fact. Yeah, alienation is treated very seriously by the courts. It's not taken lightly if it's found that one parent's alienating another. Um, we've seen it happen many times. So, you know, to conclude on the emotional aspect, you know, and, and those of you who are going through it will, will re resonate with this for sure. Divorce is more like a marathon than a sprint. To make it to the end, you need to take good care of yourself along the way. What it all comes down to I mean, of all of the things we said, if there's one takeaway, it is take care of yourself because this process is hard. It is arduous. It is long. It is drawn out. It is difficult. And when you're dealing with somebody who is high conflict, you need to take care of yourself because that's where your power is. You can't give away your power. Yeah, absolutely. So what happens? What happens after the divorce? If you're uh, separation or divorce is near final. If you're on here and you're near final or final, congratulations. Uh, you've come so far and I know it wasn't easy. Uh, the road to recovery and healing lies ahead. Uh, so what do you want your life to look like after divorce? That's a question I'm throwing out there to all of you who are on right now. What do you want? What do you want your life to look like after you shed this relationship that has been holding you back that has been beating you down that have been making you feel downtrodden what do you want to see in the future for you in your life let's uh hear some comments from you uh in the chats andrea and see what uh see what people are are looking for yeah absolutely pop in the chat you know what do you want your life to look like what are your goals what are your aspirations where do you see yourself after all of this is done and final what's beyond the divorce because that's often what gets us through the divorce, right? Is starting to think about what's 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 after, what's next, what's this next chapter of my life, what's the next book gonna look like? Maybe we're closing a book, you know, one not just a chapter. What what does the next part look like? What can I do to make it better? One thing I'll encourage you to do as we uh, look at uh, some chats that are coming in there. One thing I'll encourage you to do is to keep seeking professional help. Uh, you know, just because you you've gotten the, the legal piece dealt with and you've got a final order, it doesn't mean that's the end of it. If you've been getting uh, professional help, if you've been getting uh, help from a therapist or, or a coach, I would encourage you to keep that going, uh, you know, uh, for a while because uh, you've been through it, you know, and uh, we don't expect you to, to be fully, uh, you know, reformed right after. It might take some, some time. So, uh, by all means, you should continue to seek professional help. Absolutely. That's so important. Um, like it doesn't end just because you get a divorce certificate or a divorce order, right? There's, there's so much more to it. And there's so much healing that needs to take place. And a therapist or coach can really help you with that. So let's uh, take a look at some of the comments. Um, Natasha says, cooperative, happy, and healthy co-parenting. Yes, that's great. That's great to strive for that. That's awesome. Patel says, building back my financial independence and doing things for myself that I haven't done in a long time. I love that. That's great. Yes, it's my financial independence. Absolutely. And that can be built back. That's, a, that's the nice thing, you know, is that we still have the opportunity to do so much, right? And we can create and build a life for ourselves and, and be more successful than we ever were. I mean, I can say that honestly from personal experience. I, I've done that myself and it, it absolutely can happen. Happily living with my kids back to excelling in my life and career once once I used to before getting married. Yes, that's great. That's great. Absolutely. Excelling in your career. This is your chance to focus on your kids and your career and developing that. Yeah. Celia says, a peaceful, healthy, and happy life for myself and my kids. Yes. Peace is so, that is it. That is my, <laughs> is my word too. Absolutely. Inner peace. That is what I always strive for. 
Monica says therapy has been life altering. Yes, yes. And that's the next thing we're going to talk about. Absolutely. Therapy, um, you know, if you're if you're in therapy, well, we kind of just talked about that, you know, stay in it, keep doing that. That's something that's really, really important. And also keep taking care of yourself, you know, you're probably feeling really drained, really just kind of exhausted from all of this. Make time for your hobbies, make time for interests, figure out what your interests are again. Maybe you are so involved in your relationship that you kind of lost a part of who you are and what you love. This is your opportunity now to rediscover that. You know, who were you before your marriage? Or actually, better yet, who are you after? Because who you were before doesn't even matter as much as who you are now, right? So figure out who you are, what you love, what interests, what hobbies do you want to get into or maybe get back into? And, uh, you know, what about exercise? Are you finding time in your day, every day to exercise, even just for a few minutes? Are you going to try yoga or meditation? Try something that really helps make you feel better. That's great. I'm seeing some really great comments here. Support groups can be very beneficial. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And you've got to you've got to keep busy. You've got to keep busy. You've got to get social again. You know, uh, as I said, chances are if you're with someone narcissistic, they've whittled away at the friends you had and the support that you you probably came into the relationship with. One of the first things they do is try to uh, make it seem like no one else is important, just they're important. So. Um, you know, that, that, uh, that support group you had, you've got to go back to it and, and, uh, and, and, and re-engage them, uh, keep busy, be social, get out there. You'll, you'll discover yourself again. Uh, you can't, uh, you know, let this, uh, this, uh, person just, uh, you know, ruin your life. Once you're out of it, the relationship go find yourself again. Yeah, Absolutely. And lastly, you know, again, we kind of touched on this before, but set boundaries. Boundaries define your post-divorce relationship. They tell people how to treat you, what you will put up with, what you won't put up with. Be very clear about what your boundaries are. Make sure you set those, set them with your spouse, with kids, with family members. So, you know, think about cutting out or limiting contact with anybody who's maybe not supportive of you during this process because you don't need any more stress. So, so final thoughts here. Moving forward from a narcissistic relationship is a transforming, uh, transformative journey that requires commitment, self-reflection, healing, and personal growth. You deserve love, respect, and happiness beyond the confinements of a narcissistic relationship. By healing and by embracing your personal power, you can, in fact, break free from the chains of the past and find true fulfillment and happiness in your journey beyond divorce okay it's a it's a tough situation you're in but you can get out of it lots of people do with help and support and they move on and they're happier for it okay absolutely so now we're going to move on to um some q a so if you do have a question we're going to answer a few feel free to uh pop them in the chat Thank you. Thank you, Celia. Thank you all so much for joining us. I'm so glad that you enjoyed it. Um, yeah, so feel free to pop a question in the chat if you'd like, and we'd be happy to answer it. And we'll start off with some of these frequently asked questions that we get all the time. I want a divorce, but how do I tell my narcissistic partner I want a divorce? That's that's a tough one because we all know that, you know, the narcissistic partner is going to likely fly off the handle. There's going to be, you know, all kinds of of anger and resistance to that kind of change and they're going to feel like they're um being attacked right because they, they're feeling like they're not you know the center of yeah. the universe anymore and they don't understand it so that's a great question um you have to approach this one with sensitivity you've got to really plan ahead think about where you're going to do it how you're going to do it um you know if your narcissistic partner is a person who is prone to violence, you don't want to be doing that in the house by yourself. You want to make sure you have a third party present. Safety you want to, yeah, a safety plan in place, or maybe you want to do it in a public place. If you're afraid he's going to lash out, maybe you want to do it over the phone, right? It really depends on the type of person that you're dealing with. Some, some the narcissist range, right? Like some of them are more covert and that they're not 
obvious about it and some of them are more overt where they're you know very violent so it really depends on the type of person you're dealing with but you want to have a safety plan in place and you want to have a strategy before you tell them and and a plan because you definitely don't want to be walking into something and telling them and then all of a sudden they explode right you want to have a plan where are you going to go afterwards you're very welcome that's awesome How does a narcissist uh, respond to divorce? Well, as Andrew said, narcissists, uh, you know, it's a, it's a sliding scale, right? So, so you have some are going to react extreme, some are going to uh, pretend they're okay with it, but then just, just venom boils in them, right? And they'll attack you, uh, but maybe they won't be as aggressive initially as, as one party may be. So it, in essence, what I'm saying is, they're going to respond in a myriad of ways. Some things are consistent. They're going to blame you for the relationship failing. That is unequivocal. They are going to blame you uh, for this thing not working out. Uh, and uh, they're going to attack. And it's going to be a full-on attack. Um, so, so like I said, when we come upon it, we want to get in front of a, an adjudicator or a judge as fast as possible. We're not going to waste a, a bunch of time, years of your life, negotiating um with this person it's just uh it doesn't work and if i could andrew i'll just take the next one because yeah. the next uh, frequently asked question speaks of you know can we go to mediation uh that would be a no it's not going to work uh andrew maybe you can explain to them why we've found that uh mediation just a waste of time and money when you're dealing with a true narcissist Absolutely. When there's a power imbalance, like there often is when you're dealing with a narcissist, mediation won't work because a mediator can't make a decision. A mediator can encourage you to negotiate a separation agreement. But at the end of the day, if, if the narcissist is not providing disclosure and not agreeing to the terms that are reasonable, you're not going to get anywhere. So you can go, I've seen people go for two, three, four, ten 10 sessions and get absolutely nowhere. And then you're back to starting from square one if you have to go to court and bring an application. So yeah, so again, I mean, depending on the circumstances, obviously every situation is different, but for the most part, mediation tends to not work. We get a lot of clients who've tried mediation who come to us after saying like, I need this to go to court. I need to bring a court application because it's not working. Yeah. Um, it's a great question in the chat here. With narcissistic partners, there's often coercive control and criminal harassment. How do family and criminal law intersect? Yeah, and and uh, you know, unfortunately, unfortunately, the the avenues of family law and and criminal defense uh, often intersect, and um, you know, it, and 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 sometimes. Uh, Look, in Ontario, there's a zero tolerance on domestic violence. That means if, if an allegation is brought forward, someone's going to be charged. And normally they have to go through uh, a trial before they're determined innocent. So, you know, the pendulum has swung a long way, you know, back in the day, uh, you know, cops would come to the door. Someone would open the door and say, hey, everything's fine here. And the cops would leave. They don't do that anymore. Um, you know, someone's going to be arrested and someone's going to have to prove that, you know, what allegations are being brought uh, did not, in fact, happen. They have to go to court, generally speaking, right, because there's zero tolerance on that. So uh, criminal courts are, you know, uh, I think doing a better job in protecting, uh, you know, victims of domestic violence. But at the same time, you have people who make up false allegations about criminality and violence because they know that that is a way to gain an advantage in family court because immediately whoever the allegations are brought against is thrown out of the house. You know, that you have the kids. If the allegations uh, uh, claim that the violence happened in front of the kids, now that party can't even have access to the kids for a while, you see. So so that's the, that's the delicate dance that is done regarding family law and criminal court. Criminal courts needed to protect people from family violence. But then there are people who use criminal court falsely, making false allegations, to gain an advantage in family court. And once again, there's about evidence and, and sorting things out. And I've seen it both ways. You know, I've seen it where uh, our clients have been victims of serious violence. And I've seen it where our clients were falsely accused. And, and it took us years to sort that out. So, 
Uh, it's a process. They're, they intertwine. It's not a perfect uh, remedy. I think the courts are, are trying to, uh, if it's, a, if it's a, 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 an assault allegation involving the family, in some cases, courts are trying to handle it all under one roof, in essence, kind of a, a joint family law, uh, criminal court uh, uh, venue, if you will. They try to do that sometimes as well. But it is, it is something that happens quite often and uh, it's being worked on. I know a lot of women in particular are afraid of, of, of violent outbursts. And, and I think the courts, criminal courts are doing a better job in protecting kids, women, and men are victims of, uh, of family violence as well. Uh, and women get charged and locked up too. I want, I knew, uh, you know, I had a female client who threw a, threw a, a, one of those pink soft bedroom slipper at her husband. It missed him, but just the fact she threw it, she spent three days in jail then because she was arrested. Uh, she was arrested on a Friday and they don't have weekend court. So she spent Friday night, Saturday and Sunday night in jail. And Monday I went down and got her out. But three days for throwing a pink bedroom slipper because once again zero tolerance domestic someone's getting arrested. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, I think that is that is it for that. So thank you all so much for joining us tonight. Um, if you have not already, uh, you know, we have our book, The Path to Resilience, A Guide to Winning Against a Narcissist in Court and in Life. It's a great That's guide. right. And let me, allow me, Andrea. Andrea wrote that book. I know my name's on it too. I did very little in it, but she was gracious enough to allow me to, to, uh, to take part in it. It's a really helpful tool. It's got some great tips and strategies, coaching uh, points that uh, she puts in there, how to help you. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a great read. Uh, people who've read it have loved it. In fact, the book's a bestseller on Amazon. Uh, so you want to uh, pick that up. It's, uh, she spent a lot of time on that. And it's, uh, I'm really proud of the work Andrea did on that. So uh, have a look at it. I've got a, I've got a copy here um, you know, uh, uh, that I, I have when people come to the office. We have a few copies here as well. Uh, we just had a great book signing in Burlington that was well attended and people were excited there to come in and get a copy of the book. So Path, uh, The Path to Resilience is the name of the book, A Guide to Winning Against a Narcissist in Court and in Life by Andrea Klein. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So thank you all so much for spending the evening with us. Um, and if you are in the process of a high conflict separation or divorce, we'd be happy to meet with you, consult with you on your individual situation, you know, give you some advice, some tips. And, uh, you know, we are um, open to new clients always. So, you know, feel free to give us a call, send us an email. We'll put our contact information in the chat and feel free to reach out. We'd be more than happy to help guide you through this time. That's right. And our, our firm is remote. That means we meet you like this. We meet you via Zoom. We meet some clients in person as well, if they insist, but we find that most people are comfortable with just meeting this way now. We tend to meet our clients only if we go to court. Uh, I'm noticing these days, but uh, we're in uh, Oakville, we're in Toronto, uh, we're in Ottawa, and we're in Fort Lakes, but we service all across Southern Ontario. In fact, we've got a uh, a trial up in North Bay that we'll be going to in, in about six weeks. So people are calling for our help from all over the province, and so we're happy to accommodate. We know what we're doing in this space. If you're involved with a narcissistic partner and you're trying to get out, um, uh, allow me to suggest you call the Riley firm. Uh, we'll help you uh, get out of it and help you move on with your life as well. Thanks for joining us tonight. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Have a wonderful evening.